Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Alice Barnard, the Chief Executive of the EDGE Foundation. EDGE was calling for reform in the education system long before the COVID pandemic, when trends like the fourth industrial revolution began to challenge our thinking about the purpose and future of education. We're part of a growing movement of teachers, parents, students and employers who believe now is the right time to ask some big questions about education. This event marks another step forward in the evolution of this conversation. Before I hand over to Anne Emros, our chair for today's webinar, I'd like to sh share with you a short video about EDGE and our mission. Hello and welcome to assessment time for a rethink brought to you by the EDGE Foundation and the rethinking assessment movement. I'm Anne Ross, former editor of TES, and I was at the first rethinking assessment meeting almost a year ago now, I think, um, and I'll be acting as the chair today. Um, this session will be recorded and available afterwards. Um, please use the Q&A function to ask questions to the panel and join the conversation on Twitter using the hashtag Rethink Assessment. Now, exams dominate our entire education system. They influence what is taught, how it is taught, and the lived experience of every child, parent and teacher in the country. Um, many young people find the way our exam system works to be increasingly stressful and not a true reflection of what they can do or what they are good at. The arms race for grades is absolutely brutal and the notion of raising standards is redundant. After all, the GCSE system necessitates that the bottom third always fail. Uh, many teachers feel that, and head teachers feel that high stakes exams distort priorities and stop them from providing a well-rounded education for their pupils. Our assessment system is failing to give universities, colleges, or even employers the kind of information that they want, or evidencing the kind of dispositions and capabilities that help young people to succeed at school and indeed in life. 
Rethinking Assessment is a broad coalition of school leaders from the state and independent sectors, researchers, policymakers and employers, all working with a sense of urgency to find the best ways of evidencing the full range of young people's strengths. They are part of a global conversation about the future of assessment within, within which England is becoming increasingly an outlier. Their aims are firstly, to make the case for change. Secondly, to start to provide some workable solutions, practical ideas and approaches from classroom level to system level that can be piloted and offered as real alternatives. After two years of exams being cancelled, the glare of the spotlight has been thrown onto our assessment system. Surely now must be the time to consider fundamental reform. Now, this is the second in a series of conversations on the topic of assessment. The first took place in January with Robert Halpern MP, Chair of the Education Select Committee. Today, we will be focusing our panel discussion on the long-term future of assessment. To start proceedings, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Shadow Education Secretary and MP for Stretford and Urmston, Kate Green. A few technical hitches there um, and thank you very much for inviting me to speak to you today on an issue that I know is exciting a great deal of thought and debate among education professionals parents and students and especially as you say Anne um, over the summer and in the light of the experiences of last year. Uh, the way we, we assess learners and award their qualifications is one of the most important forces that shapes our education system. It, it influences the behaviour of, of pupils and institutions. It influences the curriculum that's taught and how it's delivered. And it has huge consequences for the education and the working lives of young people. The qualifications you get at 16 or at 18 drive the educational opportunities that are going to be open to you for the rest of your life and your future employment. But in the last two years, we have seen the assessment system plunged into chaos. Last year's exams fiasco saw grades awarded by an algorithm that left thousands of young people face the prospect of losing the opportunity to move on in their education or into work as they had hoped to. Many felt utterly devastated. Yet that chaos, the anxiety it caused to students and the pressure it placed on staff could have been avoided if the government had worked properly with the education sector, listened to experts and acted on the warnings that they were given. So, I have to say, would have learned from last year's experience, but despite repeated pleas for a plan B if exams couldn't proceed fairly this summer, pleas that came from, from many quarters, including education professionals, the unions and the Labour Party, and which we began making as long ago as last September, it took until January for ministers to make a decision to cancel this year's exams at the very moment that some students were actually taking their BTECs. And even now, despite the government having had a full academic year to put a plan in place, there are real risks of a repeat of last year's chaos. In the past few months, I've been meeting and listening to, to teachers, to pupils and parents. Pupils and parents are worried about students getting the qualifications they need to move on in their education and about being treated fairly. Teachers and school leaders face a phenomenal workload to try to get qualifications right while keeping schools COVID secure and keeping children safe and learning. They're fearful that when things go wrong, they'll be the ones blamed by the government and by parents. And sadly, I don't have much confidence either about the 2022 exam series. We know that the consequences of the unprecedented disruption to their learning that students have faced in the past year isn't simply coming to an end in September. Year 10 pupils across the country 
have already missed an average of one in four days that should have been spent in the classroom preparing for their GCSEs next summer. This vital time that they've lost could have huge consequences for the exams they'll be sitting less than a year from now and then for their opportunities in the future. It's simply not credible to suggest that these pupils can return to school and sit their exams next year as if everything's been normal. And while the Secretary of State does appear to have acknowledged this, we still have only vague platitudes about the need for adjustments to the system when what students, their families and staff need is clarity and certainty. And that really isn't acceptable. The government must urgently set out a clear plan, working with the sector, and that's why I'm now calling on the Secretary of State to set out the plan for next year by the 1st of September. Pupils and teachers need to know what the government have in mind when they return to the classroom and must be consulted so that their experience and expertise are respected in the process. And we know from the many practical and sensible suggestions that have been made by many in the sector, that there are entirely viable ways of doing this, ensuring that pupils are assessed on what they've actually learned, not on what they've missed, and that children's very different experiences of the pandemic are fairly reflected in the assessment process. By showing leadership, the government can bring the education together and deliver a fair plan for young people. But time is fast running out, and ministers really must act as a matter of urgency. Now, of course, the events of the last year have exposed not just the importance of getting exams right in a single exceptional year, but the deeper stresses and strains that are in the system. So last summer saw a huge amount of controversy when grades were awarded following the application. Of algorithms. But although we haven't seen such a reaction to the use of algorithms in previous years, of course, they have had a major impact on the grades of qual and qualifications that have been awarded even in normal years. Meanwhile, the disruption to children's learning caused by COVID and the cancellation of exams highlighted risks that were always inherent in a system that relies heavily on a single terminal exam being taken by students. And the concerns that already existed that some children leave school entirely without qualifications, without what they have achieved being recognised, became starker than ever when we considered the number of children who are going to leave school over the next few years, unable fully to make up their lost learning and demonstrate their full potential. But important though they are, I have to say that these concerns don't give anyone a free pass to do away with exams altogether. The use of centre assessed grades has highlighted the deficiencies of alternative approaches, which can't simply be wished away without serious consideration. Relying on teachers grading students' work has created an enormous burden on staff. It's heightened fears of confrontation between parents and students and teachers. And with wide variations having occurred in the way students' work has been assessed, posed serious questions about fairness. So as we emerge from the pandemic, we have to learn the lessons of the last year and create a system that's both fairer and more secure, and one that we design in dialogue with children, staff, families, educational institutions and employers to forge a new national consensus. But that's not something that we can achieve in a vacuum, only thinking about the assessment system. Rethinking assessment must be part of holistic reform of our education system. Assessments don't just reflect our education system and the learning it contains, they shape it with a system of incentives that impact both learners and institutions. But they must also be driven by what we want education to achieve for young people. And that's why our assessment system needs to be built on the same principles as our education system as a whole one that offers opportunities for all, whatever their background, that puts high standards and fairness at its heart, and that gives all young people a broad, balanced curriculum that sets them on the path to learn and earn throughout their life journey. 
too often the existing system doesn't achieve those goals. The use of high stakes exams can have a distorting effect on what is taught and learned, despite the best efforts of dedicated teachers. Time and again, we've heard of certain subjects being squeezed out of the curriculum because they're not assessed or they don't feature as prominently in accountability measures, with the arts among the first subjects to be lost, despite their huge importance in delivering an enriching education. We remain an outlier in putting students through a system of multiple terminal exams at GCSE level setting pupils on a relatively narrow path that sees many young people studying only three subjects after the age of 16. It's in part because of the structure of our system of assessments and qualifications that the options available to pupils are often too narrow, that specialism starts too soon, and fewer subjects are stu stu studied at a relatively young age, shutting pupils out of opportunities that could be hugely valuable to them later in their life or their education. And we still fail to equip young people with the skills that employers say they most value. If we really want to prepare young people for the future, they must be able to study a mix of academic and vocational subjects. And we must recognise that skills, creativity and knowledge go hand in hand together. So these are the challenges I believe we need to resolve. And I'm, I know there are challenges that you too are thinking very deeply about. And I'm really delighted, therefore, to be with you today to hear your thoughts and ideas, your thoughts about the curriculum, about the timing, the format and the volume of assessments, about the role of teachers, exam boards, regulators and inspectors, about what fairness looks like and about how our assessment system can be a catalyst for young people's future success, not an obstacle to it. In short, I'm looking forward to hearing from you about what shape our education system should take, what we want to achieve, and how our system of assessment can enable that. I don't believe we should satisfy ourselves with lazy answers to those questions, because there's too much at stake for our young people. And so I'm very much looking forward to an enriching and challenging discussion. And thank you very much for inviting me to join you. Okay, thank you very much, Kate. Um, please remember to send in your questions um, on the Q&A function of the app. Um, before we start talking about what Kate has been saying, um, I'd like to introduce Sarah Jane Blakemore, Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge. My name is Sarah Jane Blakemore. I am Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Neuroscience at the University of Cambridge and I run a lab that works on the adolescent brain and today I'm going to talk about the teenage brain and exams and look at whether there's a misalignment between what we know about the teenage brain and our assessment system. So adolescence is these days usually defined as the period of life between 10 and 24 years. This is a very protracted period of development. It's a unique period of profound biological, psychological and social development. Now we've only really known about how the brain develops during adolescence in the past 20 years. Before that we really knew nothing about human brain development at all and that's important because GCSEs were introduced before anything was known about how the teenage brain develops. They were introduced in the late 80s back then and right up until the early 2000s it was assumed by neuroscientists that the human brain stops developing at some point in childhood. Now we now know that that is not the case at all and that in fact the human brain continues to develop right throughout childhood and adolescence and even into early adulthood and we know that because we are now able to scan the living human brain using MRI scanning in particular. So this is an MRI scanner. MRI scans uh, produce very detailed images of the human brain and tell us a lot about how uh, um, the brain structure develops uh, across the lifespan. So brain structure, we can measure various things, including the amount of white matter and gray matter the brain contains. Now, many studies have used MRI over the past 20 years to study how the brain changes across childhood 
and adolescence in humans. And what those studies have shown is that there are really protracted and substantial changes to both gray matter and white matter in the human brain. And I'm gonna give you one example of that. This is a study that I was involved with led by uh, Kate Mills, um, where we analyzed data from four different cohorts of participants uh, in, in different places in the world. So um, one cohort was from NIMH in the USA, another from Pittsburgh in the USA, another from Oslo in Norway, and another from Leiden in the Netherlands. Now altogether across these four different cohorts, there were 391 participants aged between seven and 30 years. And the important thing about these studies is that, is that they're longitudinal in what, whereby each participant is scanned multiple times as they grow up, giving really high quality uh, and, and quite large scale data sets. So a couple of the main findings from this analysis um, is first of all, that cerebral white matter volume increases across adolescence. So what you're seeing here is a graph showing uh, white matter across the whole brain plotted against age in years from five to 30 years. And what you can see is that in all four cohorts, there's remarkable consistency between the four cohorts, even though they're completely independent samples of children and adolescents, there's a steady increase in white matter across late childhood through adolescence to, to mid uh, the mid twenties. In fact, white matter volume increases by about 1% each year during adolescence. At the same time that white matter is increasing, cortical gray matter volume is decreasing. And you can see that here. So these are the same four cohorts of participants, but here you're seeing their cortical gray matter volume. So that's gray matter from the cortex, the surface of the brain uh, plotted against age and years. Here you can see that uh, cortical gray matter is highest in late childhood and then undergoes a very substantial decline during adolescence and levels off in the mid 20s. In fact, gray matter volume decreases by about 1.5% each year during adolescence. I'm going to show you that in a slightly different way. Here's a video of uh, an MRI image of the cortex of the brain. That's the surface of the brain. This is the back, this is the front. And what you see here is how gray matter changes between the ages of four and 21 in this case. Um, and gray, the, the changes in gray matter volume have been color coded. So as the brain loses gray matter, it becomes less red and more blue. So you can see that here, this is going through childhood, right throughout adolescence and up until the age of 21. And you can see those very gradual changes in gray matter volume. Um, you can also see that it doesn't happen uniformly across the whole brain. The back of the brain tends to develop before the front of the brain. And that's interesting because the back of the brain contains your visual cortex, that is the region that processes vision, whereas the front of the brain contains uh, areas that process uh, high level cognitive uh, processes like the prefrontal cortex here. So regions of the brain that, um, that control high level cognitive functions um, are the latest brain regions to develop. And perhaps not surprisingly, there is very substantial and protracted development uh, into cognition in adolescence, particularly to high level cognitive processes such as self-regulation, decision-making, planning, futuristic thinking, self-awareness, creativity. Creativity is, has been found to be higher in adolescence than in adulthood. Exploration of the environment, uh, risk-taking. Adolescents uh, take more risks than adults do in general. And particularly, and this is what my lab focuses on, social cognition, um, social interaction, social understanding, peer affiliation and peer influence. Now to go back to the brain, what does it mean that white matter is increasing and gray matter is decreasing during adolescence? Well, these are thought to reflect really important neurodevelopmental processes, processes uh, by which we think that neuroplasticity is heightened in adolescence. And that's because these neurodevelopmental processes confer plasticity to the brain. So these neurodevelopmental processes include myelination and axonal growth. So 
Uh, the brain contains neurons which have a long fiber attached to them called an axon. And during development, that axon grows in diameter and becomes coated in a fatty substance called myelin. And both of those processes um, uh, myelination and axonal growth mean that uh, the speed of neuronal transmission increases during development. Um, thirdly, synaptic pruning is known to occur during adolescence. That is where um, the connections between brain cells, the synapses, are pruned away if they're not being used. Now, all three of these mechanisms uh, are mechanisms of neuroplasticity. That is the way in which the brain adapts according to its environment, the way we learn new information and new knowledge. And as such, adolescence is thought of as a sensitive period of brain development with heightened neuroplasticity. This confers both opportunity to learn, to be creative, maybe opportunities for things like rehabilitation and interventions, and also vulnerability, particularly vulnerability to mental illness. And that's what I'm going to turn to next. So we know from big epidemiological studies that adolescence is a period of vulnerability to mental health problems. Most mental illnesses first appear before the age of 18 years and mental health problems such as depression and anxiety and eating disorders and self-harm have become increasingly prevalent amongst young people in the UK and the pandemic seems to have aggravated this trend. Now the peak age of onset of mental health conditions such as depression and eating disorders occurs in mid adolescence and so coincides with GCSEs, these multiple high stakes national exams that our young people have to sit. I think we should think about that a bit and whether that's really ideal uh, given what we know about the vulnerability that neuroplasticity in the brain confers at this age. In fact, if you ask young people, as multiple large surveys have done, what do you find most stressful? They tend to cite exam stress and fear of academic failure as their most prominent worry. And in fact, calls to Childline about exam stress, workload or fear of failure doubled between 2015 and 2019. So this is a problem that's getting worse, not better. Now, not all young people are mentally uh, unhealthy. Fortunately, most are in fact fine and, uh, are, and their well-being is good. But the key thing here is the individual differences are really huge. And you can even see that in the brain development data. So I'm going to show you again in my last data slide. Um, this is the cortical gray matter volume graph I showed you previously in the four different cohorts. What I showed you previously were the lines of best fit. And what I didn't show you were the raw data. And that's what you can see here. Each of these dots is a different individual. And you can see that the individual differences are really vast. And the reason I'm showing you this, uh, this plot now is just to point out that GCSEs are done here when young people are between 15 and 16, when there's a vast amount of variation in brain development. So I suppose this is making the point that we're trying to squeeze this individual variation into a kind of one size fits all system. So just to summarize what I've said in this very short talk, the brain undergoes substantial development during adolescence. Cognitive and social capacities also development, develop. We know that creativity and exploration are heightened in adolescence compared with adulthood. Adolescence is considered a sensitive period of brain development and there are vast individual differences, but we have a one size fits all assessment system. So I think we really need to think about whether GCSEs are the optimal way to assess achievements and capabilities of the developing young person. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Sarah Jane. That was uh, very enlightening and we're now going to have a discussion and we'll take some questions from the audience. But first, um, let me introduce the other panellists. Um, apart from Alice, who you've met, and Kate, uh, we've also got Sarah Fletcher, who is High Mistress at St Paul's Girls School, and Mita Woke, Director of Product Development AI at IBM Z. So if we bring them all in and we're going to have a discussion about what we've just heard. If I could just um, ask Kate 
before before we do. Kate, would you mind just sort of summarising what Labour's position is for exams in 2022 and, and assessment and assessment then long term? Well, I'm really here today to hear your ideas um, because we're still in a policy development process and, and you know, we haven't got um, a manifesto written and it would be premature of me to be making policy commitments to experts and practitioners. What I'd say about the 2022 exams, actually what is what I said about the 2021 exams, I hope they can go ahead fairly. But it's absolutely imperative that we have alternative plans now or very soon by the beginning of September, because there's a very strong likelihood that um, they can't take place in, in, in usual terms. Too much learning disruption has already been suffered. And there is a real risk of further learning disruption and for that to affect different children differently over the coming year. So. Um, we know that there are ways in which you can um, adapt assessments to um, enable children to be tested on what they have been able to learn in these very exceptional circumstances, um, where you can reflect perhaps different learning experiences. So, uh, for example, more optionality in, in what is assessed is one um, mechanism that we suggested last year, which I guess is likely to be appropriate again in 2022 if we've seen um, some children unable to cover all of the curriculum. Um, I think it's it's become clear that if we're going to have an element of teacher assessment again or have to fall back on an element of teacher assessment again, that the less load on staff actually just as much stress on the students I've talked to as taking exams and poses on them. And in fact, many of them have had to take a lot of exams anyway. One student told me that she'd taken 25 exams uh, this year, where normally she would have expected to have taken eight because teachers were trying to gather data to make a teacher assessment. And I think it's very important that we properly train teachers to standardize, to moderate whatever term you like to use in a way that ensures that students are treated fairly. So. I think I want to see this in the plan B. I want to see how the government intends to accommodate an uncertain year ahead completed, which is that there's been a lot of learning disruption and that's been different for different students. And most of all, um, students are really concerned about how they're going to be perceived coming out of these assessments. So I've listened to, into a lot of meetings with students where they've said, we're always going to be treated as the year that for whom special allowances were made, that our exam result, our results don't really count this year. And that's profoundly unfair to those young people. It's, it's a perception, I'm not saying it is what employers or universities or people in future are going to think, but it is their perception that they will be seen as a year that weren't fairly and equitably assessed on what they could uh, demonstrate they had achieved and I think that's a real concern because I think that more than having to take exams is what's demoralizing the young people I've listened to at the moment. Okay thank you and um, Sarah can I bring you in on that um, are your students demoralized by that? I think actually what this year has done is to give young people the opportunity to show what they can do in many ways because they've had the opportunity rather than in just one sudden death exam to be able to come back, to be able to work um, in far friendlier conditions in order to show what they can do, how they can think, how they can answer questions. So I think there is some real learning that we can take from this in terms of the future and how we can then prepare an assessment system for the future. I think if we were planning teacher assess grades, none of us would devise them in the way that they have currently been devised. But nonetheless, I do think that there are ways in which this potentially has been a way in which young people can show more fairly what they can do than simply under a sudden death system. So are my students demoralized? No, I really don't think they are. Um, I really don't think they are, but I don't think that this is the final resting place for assessment um, for the future of this country. And I think that there's a lot more thought that needs to be placed on it. And I think finally, my big fear 
is that we're being presented in so many um, respects by this kind of false binary between the notion that we've either got exams that we sit down as traditional exams or teachers assessed grades within their current format. And I think that assessment can be a lot more nuanced, varied, really robust, but far fairer to students. Um, I don't necessarily mean that we take away in their entirety uh, terminal examinations in their current form, but I do think that assessment needs to be mixed up, it needs to be more plural, and to give young people more opportunities to show what they can do, which will remove some of that anxiety that Sarah Jane's been speaking about. And I guess what I'd really like to ask is, given that we're less than a year away now from the next set of public examinations, rather than waiting to see what next year holds, I think we know already that there are inequalities in learning. I think we know already that there's a deficit in learning. So what actually are we doing? And that, I think, is the key thing that I would like answered um, from, from whichever political party from September. What are we doing? How are we going to address this? How are we going to make this more equitable? Are there other ways of assessing that we can start putting in now? Because if you're talking about training teachers and preparing students, that's got to be done straight away. That can't wait until Christmas. It can't wait until sometime in the future. We've got to sort it. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Alice, um, Sarah talked about shaking it all up for the future. What would you like to see happen? I think um, Sarah brought up some really interesting points there. And I think it's really interesting that education is so riddled with these false dichotomies. Uh, we, you know, listening to Gavin Williamson this afternoon, he said quite clearly in the House of Commons, the best form of assessment is always exams. We are being asked to believe that it's exams or nothing, knowledge or none, high standards or low, rigour or some flaky system. And this is just not right. There's a, there's, a, there's a very clever and as Sarah said, nuanced way of approaching um, assessment. Um, and we have so many opportunities to explore what this might look like over a period of time. In Kate's speech, she's talking very much about the imminent issue of 2022. And I think that is something that is very important both to uh, teachers, to parents and to young people. But there's something bigger going on here at the moment. And that is the fact that we really need to think about how we fairly address the system going forward. And I think COVID has accelerated our thinking on this. It's not that there was no thought on whether assessment was suitable. Um, it was just the fact that I think COVID has uh, perhaps made something that looked impossible. The idea that exams may not exist for two years. That was an impossible thought two years ago. It, it hasn't been a perfect system. And I think uh, those that are critical of rethinking the way assessment will work will use this as a reason not to progress the conversation. And that cannot be right. We talk about this forgotten third when we talk about these young people who come away with actually no recognisable qualifications. And a third, that sounds quite a lot, but actually what we're talking about is 150 to 200,000 students. I'll just say that again, that's 150 to 200,000 students. We've got to do something that addresses that huge deficit. And the best way to do that is to have thoughtful conversation about how we approach assessment going forward. And exams may be part of that because actually exams in some conditions work really well, but so do lots of other uh, manners of assessment, including extended projects, for example, or work that uh, we see very clearly in things like the International Baccalaureate. Lots of ways of assessing young people, both in how they acquire the knowledge, but also how they apply the knowledge. And we all know that knowledge is at young people's fingertips all the time. So it's really about how they interrogate that knowledge and how they apply it, not necessarily how long they can remember it and whether they can regurgitate that in a critical cliff edge exam at the end of a year. So yes, we do need to address the, the issue that is facing us with 2022, that's really important, but let that not overshadow the fact that actually this is a much longer plan, three to five years, five to 10 years, to really see an equitable change in the way in which we shape young people's lives, the way we measure them, the way employers measure them, the way society measures them. It's got, we've got to start to really shift uh, the agenda on this. Okay, thank you very much. I'd just like to turn to Sarah Jane's 
uh, talk. So, right, Sarah, you don't, Sarah Jane, you don't have to come in here. I want to ask um, Mita perhaps to respond to some of the things you were saying, especially in the fact that um, exams have been with us for a long time. But what we know about the brain and neuroscience, as Sarah Jane said, we've only just sort of known for the past 20 years, yet we're being really slow to take that knowledge and apply it to what we're doing. Um, what would you have to say about that, Mita? Yeah, just to add, give a little bit of background, you know, how we view things from the tech world is we are in the middle of the fourth industrial revolution, right? It's a bit defined by AI, automation, advances in genomics, uh, genetic engineering, quantum computing, et cetera. And that has caused a radical shift in the future of work, which is here now. That future of work is saying that people are going to be uh, more passionately involved in their work. They're going to want to change their careers more often. You know, they'll have to continually learn. They'll have to continually upskill and reskill themselves. So, you know, if we look at, if we look at that skill set that's required, um, there have been a lot of research work done and a lot of studies being conducted where they've actually put it into different four different broad categories. One is just uh, digital, this, you know, self-discipline, self-leadership, and I, I can't remember the fourth one. But out of those four buckets, they've really netted out, you know, lots of skills that are that are needed. But if you look at the World Economic Forum, Forum and the top 10 skills they've defined for a success in the future of work, it overlaps with what Sarah Jane said, that the mind is ready to receive when you're between the ages of four to 21, right? It's things like, sorry, um, it's things like, you know, cognitive ability, interpersonal skills, being able to learn in a team, being able to learn, right? Those are the skills. So I think from an employer's perspective, when we're seeing this tremendous shift and people really trying to define what they want to do with their lives, these are just course of skills, no matter what they what you do will will transfer through. There was an interesting study conducted by a Nobel award winner, where he said, can I correlate grades to overall career success? And he found that the one thing that, you know, contributes to overall career success is personality. And he said, with testing, we only test three aspects that we need to be successful, which is you know, uh, self-discipline, diligence, and, you know, perseverance, but we miss out on all of those other skills that have been clearly identified as what we need to be successful in the workplace. So I think a shift from really teaching kids those skills, nurturing those skills in them, as well as the method of evaluating them for those skills is, is much needed. Otherwise, the future of work will suffer. Okay, thank you very much. Sarah, um... Can I just come to you um, on that? How does that all feel to you for, I mean, you're sending out lots of uh, young women into the world and into the world of work. Uh, does that chime with what you think that the skills that they need and are we equipping them for the world of work? Or just life in general, really. I don't, I don't subscribe to uh, Gavin Williamson's view that it's we're just educating children to get a, a job, basically. I mean, we're educating children to live and to live a really fulfilled life. So what would you say, Sarah? I, I, I agree entirely. I think education should be about everything. And it's not just about the world of work, is it? It's about preparation for life. Um, I think also schools are about a lot more than just the curriculum, and there's a huge amount that goes on within schools that do prepare young people for life. But the curriculum occupies such a central part that it's a shame if that doesn't, and I don't think it does at the moment. I think um, the GCSEs themselves, I mean, if you really look at them, they go back pretty much to when I did O level. Sorry, I am very old. I mean, there's very little really that's in essence changed in the way that we're doing our education. And certainly very little that's different in the way that we sit down and do exams. And every year, okay, not, maybe not for the past two, but you go into that exam hall and you have young people sitting at separate desks with a pen and paper. And you look at it and you think, how on earth does that fit with the modern world? Where is the digital in there? 
You know, where is the teamwork? Where's the collaboration? Where's the research? Where's the real complex problem solving? How are we really assessing the way that people can interact with each other? All of those soft skills, which Meet has just spoken about so eloquently. No, it doesn't. Um, and I think it could, without sacrificing any of the rigor, any of the, the, the reliability, the sort of value that we want to place upon an assessment system, I think we could easily be looking at different ways of um, assessing young people, which will help them to develop all of those skills. And I just wanted to pick up on another thing as well, which is this digital business. You know, I mean, we have digital in key stage three, but it's pretty light touch. We have digital in computing as an optional subject at key stage four, but not that many students take it. And yet every single aspect of the world in which we, we move is influenced by digital and it's going to play, it does already play such a significant role in the world of work as well, that I think there is a huge piece of research involved that we need to be undertaking in how we can bring the tech world, the digital world, with all of its nuance, all of its vibrancy, all of its life, all of its meaning to young people, into the classroom, into the various things that, that they are doing, um, how we can upskill teachers to be able to deliver it with confidence, but not necessarily as a discrete subject, potentially much more cross-curricular, how we can introduce far more creative problem solving into the curriculum, which is really robust, but also how we can make the curriculum more relevant. Uh, very often this word relevant seems to be associated in people's minds with somehow kind of softening the curriculum, making it less, re less rigorous. But actually, I think the opposite is the case. Uh, we've got a really interesting discussion at the moment with Chatham House, who are incredibly passionate at the idea of engaging young people in global civics and in sustainability in a you know its largest sense engaging them really directly in the issues which are facing the world in a hugely um, sort of academically rigorous genuine fashion but harnessing all of that creativity and that questing and that questioning of teenagers in potentially in a curriculum which is going to engage them, develop them, be rigorous in all sorts of ways, but also develop those team working, the problem solving, the interpersonal skills, all of those things that uh, we can um, talk about now as being really important for the future. Um, and sure, being able to retain information, being able to speak um, with knowledge is important, but so too are so many other things. And I think we could be doing such a lot to make our curriculum much, much more engaging, relevant and interesting, and thereby drawing young people in to a sense, not of disaffection, and I'm honestly sure that quite a lot of young people feel disaffected with the curriculum, but actually bringing them into a way which is going to make them feel a lot more um, that the curriculum relates to them, where they are, who they are, and where they want to go. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Um, we're now going to go to questions from the audience because we've got quite a few. Um, I'm going to probably pounce on people who I think will um, answer one um, relevantly, uh, but please feel free to jump in if you want to. So we've got one from Keith Feely. Health, well-being and development of our children is central to the education, health and social services. So why is there almost no unification or integration of these services for 2021 and beyond? Now, I'm not sure actually who can be the best one to answer this. Um, would anybody like to jump in there? And I mean, Sarah Jane, you're the closest to um, talking about <laughs> how how all these things might be integrated sort of because we're talking you know we are talking about mental health of children um, and their education what would you say so you mean what is the best way to assess young people given what we know about their mental health development and given the multiple facets of their and their edu and education. Why is not everything brought together? Oh, that's, you mean, that's a big question. Um, 
Well, exactly. And I think, I mean, I think it's partly because of the education system, the assessment system, that not everything is brought together and not everything assessed. I mean, the, the, the linear um, exams, particularly the GCSEs, the multiple number of GCSEs, more and more exams, less and less continuous assessment, if any at all, in most subjects, means that young people have to cram as much information as they can um, into their heads to regurgitate in exam conditions, which by the way, we know from lots of research on the way the brain processes memory and learning that that information will only be retained in the short term, mostly. Most of it will go after a couple of weeks. And I'm sure you all be all familiar with that feeling when you, you, know, you can learn things quite well in the short term by cramming, but it doesn't last. Um, so what are we really doing with that? What are we assessing? Why is that skill, um, uh, given more uh, credence than other kinds of assessments, other kinds of skills, other kinds of ways of uh, being tested. And the other thing it does is that it squeezes out um, uh, things like practical uh, science classes, um, creative uh, subjects, um, the things that, you know, if you ask young people, I was involved with the Royal Society Vision Committee for Science and Maths Education a few years ago, and uh, it, there was a lot of research that um, fed into that report and one of the things we found out is that what really inspires young people to do maths and science or particularly science is the practical classes and they and we have seen over the last 10 or 15 years have been squeezed out and out and out and what went this last year because of the pandemic it was practical classes so that in now in many schools they just don't happen um, currently and, and if anything, the young people get to observe a teacher doing a practical, that is not the same as doing it yourself. We all know that, again, there's a whole lot of evidence <laughs> around that. You have to do it yourself to really be engaged with the process. Um, and this, I think, is a, is a consequence, it's a secondary consequence of our linear, multiple, high stakes exam systems. And I think that needs to be broken down before we can even consider how to bring in more creativity, more you know, social skills, learning, group activities, skills that are really going to be um, important for later life. Okay, thank you. It's, it's quite, it's a, also a political question, Kate. I mean, ideally, would you like to see an integration of all these things and all these services in some way? I mean, I have yeah. no idea how that might be done. Yeah, I thought it was more of a process question, really, in the, than a, a question about how we examine and assess students, um, although I thought Sarah Jane's remarks were really, really interesting. Um, and I would say what you need is a unifying philosophy that brings these things together, in which I would say that the Labour government with our everyday, Every Child Matters agenda sought to do. So you didn't have to necessarily reorganise services all to be in a single block. But you had to have a unifying concept of what was a good childhood and what you wanted children to experience in terms of their education, their health and well-being, support for their families and their parents and their communities, um, that you had that for all children. So whatever their backgrounds, whether um, you know, their cultural background for disabled children, that you you had a re you had all children having an enriching childhood, a commitment to an enriching childhood. Um, across all those dimensions, health, family, well-being, education, culture and, and sport, all of them um, under this banner of every child matters. And we've lost that and I, I very much regret it. Um, I think it would be um, a, a, a better approach and a, a more flexible approach and a more deliverable approach, frankly, to, to recreate, obviously not absolutely replicate, but recreate that kind of unified philosophy around the child rather than to set about a lot of structural reorganisation, which can eat up an enormous amount of government time to often not very great effect. Um, and that requires also some inspirational leadership, you know, strong political leadership, which says this is important to us as political leaders, that children are our future, that they matter to us and that we will prioritise and invest in, in their childhoods and in their future life journeys. Um, and I think, you know, Keith, that's probably part of the a big part of the answer to your question is not necessarily about reorganising services, um, although I think there are obviously um, 
silos and boundaries that are unhelpful and that we ought to examine and look to bring down. I think it's about having this unified concept of the importance of and the value we place on childhood, um, which I think we've kind of lost from um, political and policy thinking at the moment. Okay, thank you. So that's very interesting that we've lost this whole approach to childhood. Um, can you just stay there, Kate, because I've got a question that's just for you. Um, don't know if you're going to be able to, to answer it. Norman Katani, he's a student, and his question is, Dane Glenis, chief executive of Ofqual at the time, said grades are reliable to one grade either way. With the disruption faced over the past two years and ministers suggesting exams being the fairest way, could I ask if Ofqual should instruct the exam boards to raise all TAG grades by one to give students the benefit of the doubt? Unless, of course, it's a top grade because you can't raise that. <laughs> That's a nice bit of wishful thinking there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I heard that uh, remark from Dean Glenis, and um, that means that um, a lot of grades are wrong. <laughs> and that's actually really worrying. Um, so clearly we have to have um, a much more robust system of accurately assessing um, young people's attainment. And um, I don't think we know that teacher assessed grades are going to deliver um, a different picture. We don't really know what sort of picture they're going to deliver. We know that last year um, they resulted in for many students um, an improvement in their grade on what had been um, judged by the process and the algorithm, but for some it didn't. And we know that that was the cause of conflict and difficulty between some students and some teachers. And I'm very fearful we're going to see that again this year. Um, and there is also, I don't, I don't say that this is what will happen because we don't know, we need to see the outcome of this summer's process, but there is a, a, a perception that what you may in fact see this summer is teachers um, in some places awarding grades that are quite generous. And um, I don't think even Dane Glenis was suggesting that the, the inaccuracy was only in one direction. I think she was suggesting it was in both directions, that for all the grades that were understated, there were also a number of grades that were overstated. So I'm not sure the answer is um, necessarily to assume that everything is understated by one grade and let's put everything up by one grade, um, as you're suggesting, Norman. Um, I think it, it, it speaks to um, the need to be really, really, really rigorous, whatever form of assessment system we're using, really examine very rigorously how we make it as fair and as objective as we can. And that is difficult, more difficult in some subjects than others. Um, more difficult if you don't want to take con account of context. Um, but in the end, um, I don't, I have to say, I, I don't think either teacher assessed grades or teacher assessed grades plus one is inevitably going to give you a more accurate answer. Um, although I do, I do fear for what we are going to see this summer in terms of real um, potential for, for confrontation between students and teachers in respect of the grades that some will have been awarded. Yeah. And can, I, can I come in there? Would that yes, be all please. right? Please I, I think this actually goes to the heart of the whole problem with exams, and that is that although in maths you can get a pretty straight, you know, if you get it right, you get it right, and, and, and there isn't a huge amount of variation. If you look at essay-based subjects like English, my subject, history, philosophy, all sorts of things, um, you can, it's not just necessarily one grade adrift, you, you can be, you know, several adrift because it's much more interpretive. And the way that we have tried, or we, the country, has, has, has tried to compensate for that is by making mark schemes really prescriptive and by making it much more limited and narrow the box which kind of hems you in as to what the answer is that you're supposed to be giving and it's this which is actually destroying the kind of creativity it's destroying the problem solving the real thinking which is going into it and which is turning our exams into this kind of more and more sort of myopic straitjacket um, which actually is, is, I think, the nadir of education. So I think this is the real heart about what we need to think about. And, you know, for me, the image in my mind is that we've been walking down this cul-de-sac for many years, and I think we've reached the dead end of it. And what we need to do is to say, OK, exams in their current form actually aren't the fairest way of assessing in certain subjects. So perhaps let's just stand back 
and take a deep breath and say, okay, let's think again. Let's actually come out of this 50 years or however much it's been of, of believing that this to be the case. And let's really look again, not necessarily at the tags this time round, but at other ways in which you can assess. You know, and I, I was very much um, one of those who was behind developing the, the pre, uh, the, the, well, the pre, but also the extended project qualification. There are other ways. And as Alice has said, you know, across the world, there are other ways of assessing. It doesn't mean to say that we go blindly into something and pick things off the shelf because they happen to be different. What we really need is an informed debate about lots of things. One, our vision for education. What is it that we're trying to achieve? Rather than trying to answer small questions, we should be answering big questions. What are we trying to achieve? What do we want young people to be like? What do we want them to be able to do? And then how is it that we can use what we know about assessment to create a curriculum and a way, a pedagogy, a way of, of, of preparing young people, which is in fact going to achieve that and fairly assess where they are and what it is that, that they can achieve. But I also think, sort of going back to Sarah Jane's point, is that the brain, as we know, is developing until the age of 24. 16 is a really not the best time to produce exam results which effectively live with you for such a long time, such high stakes. You know, we really ought to be throwing that out further, lighter stakes, lighter touch assessment at 16 plus, um, far less weight placed upon it as a kind of staging post in the development and the assessment of young people. And then this whole issue, which has been raised by that really, really crucial question that's just been asked, actually becomes much, much more creative as a question, much, much more of a challenge to the education profession what are we doing what are we trying to achieve and how are we going to best achieve that okay thank you you mentioned creativity oh sorry got something right. coming in alice might i chip in as well I mean, please do fundamentally uh, everything that sarah has said i i couldn't agree with more um and um i think Again, there's another dichotomy here, isn't there? A false dichotomy, which is again about what is the purpose of education? Is it for the pursuit of the love of learning or is it to be a cog in some industrial wheel? And it's not one or the other. It's a hybrid of that. You know, we want to encourage that depth and thought and interaction with learning that makes it interesting and relevant to the real world. But also we want to provide young people with the skills that people like me to need to be able to deliver the workforce of the future. It doesn't have to be one or the other. It's not black or white. It's the colors in between that we're really interested in. And actually this isn't subjective. It's not that we've come together and we've decided that this isn't working. We know it's not working because it's costing the British economy 6.1 billion pounds currently because of the existing skills gap. Now, if that isn't enough to make us realize that not only do we have a social imperative, but we have an economic imperative to get this right. Okay, thank you. Mita, do you want to come yes. in as well? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, you know, Sarah and Alice and all of you, I couldn't agree with you more. I think, I mean, from a workplace perspective, when we go to hire people, whether it's a researcher we are hiring or whether, you know, for a traditional role that exists, we have to be taken through extensive interviews because we are trying to figure out how do they learn, how do they work with, with others. We are never looking at the GCSE scores or their, even their college GPAs. You know, we are looking at what skills do they have, what experiences have they had, and how, can, how do they work well, and are they innovative or not? <clears throat> So our interview process can be very exhaustive just because you know we have to dig all of this out before we bring them on. I think Alice hit on a very key point. It's just impossible to hire key skills at the moment, right? So it's not just us, but there are there are seven job openings to one position. So you know there are so many tech jobs, especially in the tech world, there are so many job openings that cannot be fulfilled because the key skills are missing. So it's not just a social imperative, like Alice said, but I agree it's an economic imperative too. Thank you. Um, let's move on to another question. This one's from Gemma Scotcher. Does the panel have a view on how our approach to assessment affects the mental health and well-being of the teaching workforce? Looking at the age range for adolescents, it looks like some NQTs would barely be out of the period of neuroplasticity, um, which is interesting. Sarah-Jane. 
Yeah, I mean, it, I, that, that's it's the two parts of that question. Firstly, the point that adolescence is much more extended. We now accept that this period of adolescence is much more extended than we ever knew prior to the ability to scan the living human brain. And I mean, I could have talked about it in my in my short talk, but the definition of adolescence has changed throughout the years. So the World Health Organization definition is still second decade of life. The UN, I think it's something like 12, I can't remember. But anyway, there are, there are different definitions. Some people think of it as the teenage years. Some people don't, some people think of it as kind of the period of life between childhood and adulthood, however you, however you define that in your particular culture. But I really like the definition 10 to 24 years, which now most of my colleagues use, because that really does take into account what we know about the biological development of the brain and when it starts to tail off. But that really changes the way we think about people. I mean, I'm a university, I work in university, I teach undergraduates, that's what I do. That's who I mix with. Some of my graduate students are under the age of 24. And you know, knowing that their brains are still developing and they're still in a, in a, um, a period of heightened plasticity, I think does change the way we, um, yeah, the way we should think about educating people even in their early 20s. And things like, um, I often, I'm often asked, you know, what, what, what do you do at university if you sort of change your mind, you're not interested in the subject you chose to do, or you flunk an exam or something. In a way, the, it, the data on neuroplasticity in the early 20s is, is sort of a positive way of looking at things because it's not too late. It's not too late to change. It's not too late to relearn to start to uh, be motivated to learn, to change subjects. Um, but this is, you know, this is a really new way of thinking about this stage of life that up until recently was thought of as already too late, it's adulthood. Um, but yes, lots of teachers will be within that age bracket as well. Um, on the other hand, lots of teachers won't, but that doesn't mean that their mental health is fine. <laughs> I mean, that's a se completely separate question, I think, the men mental health of teachers. And I mean, goodness, I, I don't need to tell anyone here that that has been really in crisis, I would say, over the last 18 months. I work with lots of teachers. I'm a school governor. I know lots of teachers and uh, head teachers as well. I cannot imagine a more stressful job, apart from maybe being working in the N NHS over the last 18 months. Um, and I, I mean, like has been said many times, and like Kate Green said, you know, the, the idea that we can just leave it to destiny as to what happens next year. We learned this year, you can't do that. You have to plan ahead. You have to have multiple contingency plans because we have no idea how the next year will unfold. And right now um, they should be planning how to teach this this next year if there's a lot of covid around if if exams can't go ahead because it's just not feasible to have so many young people in a, in a room together at the same time or 20 percent of them are off with covid or something you know this these kinds of questions should be being asked right now and being being planned and that otherwise we're going to have another year of mental health crises in the teaching profession Okay, thank you. Um, let's take another question. Can I just add, can I just add to that, Anne? Yeah, yeah. If, you, if you talk to the teaching unions, for example, teachers, representatives, representatives of school leaders, and I absolutely agree with Sarah Jane about the pressure, particularly that school leaders have experienced over the last 15 months, you know, the number of things they've had to do, often at short notice, often with contradictory instructions, often while worrying about their own family and their own um, health and safety and very much worrying about the learning and well-being of the children that they are responsible for. Um, it is, it's been an incredibly challenging year, and I very much fear that we will see quite a flight of school leaders after the pandemic as they kind of go, oh, I got through that, and now I really need a break. And we can't afford to lose those experienced and dedicated professionals. And I really would say to uh, the government and if I were the Secretary of State I would be making an absolute priority of wrapping ourselves around those expert professionals and saying how can we keep you and support you in the profession they've done an incredible job as of all school and education staff but school leaders I am especially concerned about and probably particularly primary school leaders because they have less of a support leadership team around them than you would have in a big secondary where you'd have a, you know a bigger team to work with um, which would give you although different pressures you know more people to share them with perhaps um, but, but when you talk to 
school leaders, teachers and their representatives, the thing that comes over to me most strongly that causes them stress and pressure is workload. And I would say in relation to exams and assessments, uh, it's the accountability system and exams and assessments form part of that accountability system for teachers and school leaders. That is, is where the pressure is kind of being pointed from, if you like. And I, I think this is my point about we can't just look at one bit of the system in isolation. We've had quite a lot of talk earlier about curriculum, actually. Now, now I'm sort of throwing in accountability for good measure and, and inspection regimes. And, and I think we've got to consider all of these pieces together. But I would say on workload, this has been the issue that has been raised with me again and again, uh, pre-pandemic as a constituency MP and over the last uh, year that I've been Shadow Secretary of State for Education, teacher workload, it's, it's heavy and it, it's, um, it's a real concern for teachers' representatives. And whatever assessment system we're going to put in, whether it's project-based or it's more exams or it's teacher assessment it's, or most likely it's some blend of all of the above, um, if we have to be mindful of teachers' workload and teachers' well-being and administering and operating whatever system we're, we're, we're running with. Okay. May I just say one thing, um, and it's something that is really interesting, because I think if you if the system is going to change, it's going to require uh, space and breadth for teachers to be able to be coached and supported and developed uh, in line with whatever is going to be required next. But when you look at some of the schools that are doing exceptional things at the moment, both in the independent sector and in the, in the state sector as well, it's some really dynamic things are happening. And what is very clear from some of these schools is that actually the level of teacher absenteeism is incredibly low and that the supply teacher requirements are also incredibly low, which suggests that, yes, a huge amount of work has gone into the sort of front loading of this dynamic and innovative teaching, which might be project based or uh, expeditionary led. But once those, uh, once that kind of formulaic uh, element is laid in place, the teachers are given support, space and room to be able to deliver and develop the teaching and learning for the students. And if teacher absenteeism is a guide to how teachers are feeling both physically and mentally, that's got to show that, yes, it might require some upfront investment, both in time and energy and commitment, but the long term benefit both for the teacher, the senior leadership team, but the pupils is huge. Okay, thank you. Um, we've talked a lot about secondary assessment. I think Kate, you touched upon uh, primary head. Um, we've got a question here from Madeline Holt. What about primary assessment? I'd like to ask both Sarah Jane and Kate what their position is on baseline testing of four-year-olds in maths and English due to start in September and SATs due to start again next year. Um, Sarah Jane. I mean, that's way out of my area of expertise because I work on the teenage brain. Um, yeah, so I think I probably shouldn't comment on that. Fair enough. Kate. Um, so this is um, quite a topical uh, question because we are expecting regulations in relation to the reception baseline assessments to be um, debated in Parliament in the, in the next um, couple of weeks. And, and indeed, I was just thinking about this this morning. I think they might have to be because um, if they're to be introduced in September, we don't have many more weeks to put the, le the secondary legislation through if it's needed. So I know the regulations have been laid. Uh, in respect of those um, assessments. And it, you've just reminded me with your question and to go and find out what's happening about the debate on them. Um, I, I think it'll be really interesting to gather data um, on particularly actually to gather data now about um, very about young children who are about what's happened to them in an, uh, the pandemic and, and then to see how that, um, how their learning experience Yeah, I think Kate has frozen. Um, is everybody else okay? Yeah? yeah, yeah. All right, so it might be better to- I, I, was, can I, I was just gonna add one thing, so although it's not my area of expertise at all, um, I, I, did, I did do some research a long time ago on early years 
education, it wasn't primary research. I was working for the Parliamentary Office of Science and Te Technology and the uh, Select Committee, the House of Commons Select Committee for Education, who were, who were at the time doing an inquiry into early years education. And the main consensus from the research was that in the early years, um, so in the first you know, five, six years of life, um, the most important thing for children to do is play. And they can learn through play, and they often do, and that's in a way what play is for, but they really should be spending most of their time playing. So the idea of testing them, you know, is, is not really very congruent with that. Plus, we know that in other countries, um, uh, you know, many other countries, classic, classic countries often cited as Scandinavian countries, but lots of different European countries, don't start formal education until much later than we do here. In some countries, it's six. In some countries, it's even seven or eight years. And in those countries, that the children tend to outperform our children in terms of both educational attainment and social emotional uh, learning by about age nine. So I think the you know the idea that we should be putting children through formal education earlier and earlier and testing them earlier and earlier really goes against everything we know about how children's brains and minds and social emotions develop. I don't think I think and the other thing that uh, sorry Sarah <laughs> I was going to say I think the other thing with the point that, that's very often made about all of these testing the different uh, key stages all the way through is that because we've evolved uh, organically there isn't a real coherence to to what's being tested and that uh, the skills that are that because assessment does push the way you teach and the kind of skills that you're foregrounding and that that is not a straight course as you move through education and that again what we need to do is to come back we need to rethink and actually have a vision for what it is that we want that we want to achieve but I have to say I couldn't agree more with Sarah Jane that I think um, testing inevitably in any case carries with it the sense that you haven't done as well as others and I think implanting that idea in, in, in the minds of, of very young people is, is really difficult but uh, certainly um, my little son was brought up when we were living in Switzerland and um, they don't educate, they don't do any of these things. It's play until the age of seven. And, and my goodness, what then happens is a sharp, you know, upward curve. Um, and, and it seems to me that instead of being so obsessed with testing, again, we just need to stand back and allow people to, to develop um, and to develop those characteristics that Sarah Jane's been speaking about, which are just so important. Thank you. Uh, while you're there, Sarah, I've got a question for you uh, from Andy Halliwell. Should we continue to assess students in a linear format or should we look into collaborative assessment? You know, I mean, I, I, I was never a fan of the modular approach because, again, and looking at Sarah Jane's plot chart, I just feel that people develop in so many different ways. But I think over the course of, of your key stage, whatever it is that you're assessing, I think there should be opportunities and possibly several opportunities to show what it is that you can do. And I'm certainly persuaded that elements of that should be taken rather like a music exam, you know, when you're ready to do it, rather than having to wait for everybody else or rather than being forced to do it, um, you know, earlier than, than you're ready. And again, my own anecdote from my own children was trying to teach them to read. And I absolutely remember getting frustrated that they couldn't do something one week which was blindingly obvious to them the following week. So brains develop in different ways. And as a teacher, I've so often prepared people for A-level exams even, and been at my wits end around Easter. You know, you can't write the essay. I know you're not gonna get the result. And then finally the penny drops. So I think there should be definitely ways in which people can show what they can do in a much more graduated fashion over the course. I don't think we should return to a modular session where it is you're examined at the end of year 10, you're examined at the end of year 11, whatever you want. I think it should be a much more nuanced fashion than that. And I think we can do that really easily. And I think that that would make assessment for young people and also for teachers uh, a lot more interesting and a lot more natural. OK, thank you. I see we've got Kate back, which is wonderful. Um, so I can ask you a, um, another question, Kate. Um, this is from Eddie Playfair. He says, Kate, thank you for your summary of the challenges facing the system. 
and for proposing a debate about what we want from education. You spoke about the need for all students to have the opportunity to study a mix of vocational and academic qualifications. Should this apply to 16 to 18 year olds as well? And should we move away from a culture of sorting young people at 16 towards a more inclusive curriculum? Yeah, I've come back on my phone and something seems to have gone badly wrong with parliamentary technology. <laughs> hey, um, so um, I'm a Scot, as you might have picked up from listening to me, and I therefore was educated in a, um, a very different tradition where we didn't specialise so early. And in fact, the uh, post-16 curriculum was not narrow, um, narrowed to only three subjects. And I'm a big fan, therefore, of a, a broader post-16 curriculum. I'm a big fan of it and I'm a product of it. Um, and I think um, there are worrying um, indications that the trends are going in the other direction, in fact, that we are seeing more specialisation, not yet, not less. I think that, for example, the introduction of T levels and, and everybody welcomes the, the development of a really high quality uh, technical route and technical qualification. But I think you know, they're setting up an even sharper dichotomy between technical and academic roots for 16 um, when actually real life isn't like that and, and I think that's perhaps what was being suggested earlier when we were talking about knowledge about skills about creativity about digital um, competence and all the rest um, you know life doesn't really sharply divide into you're doing an academic or a vocational type of um, role or profession um, and I'd also say I think it, it limits people's flexibility for the future that we're going to you know, we're moving into an uncertain future, an uncertain labour market. We don't know what people, you know, what kind of jobs that young people today will be doing. They'll still be working in the 2070s. So you want to equip them with, with capabilities to evaluate data, to think and interrogate uh, critically, to um, be creative and, and innovative and imaginative. Um, and I think what we've actually got is a much more rigid and um, rather... Um, over specialist system post 16 and um, actually even pre 16 as I say we're seeing some subjects being squeezed out of the curriculum because of the assessment and accountability process but I, I absolutely do feel that um, we are driving young people down too narrow a route in many cases in the, that 16 to 18 period. Okay thank you. Mita would that be uh, music to your ears? It is it is and I, I I might be the odd one out in the tech world who, who holds that point of view, and but I really appreciate Kate what you said because, especially in the world of AI, when we are looking at a 360 degree fairness framework and we are saying AI cannot be biased, you know, if you're driving a car and your car has to make a choice between hitting a person and hitting a dog, what choice should it make? We we don't know because it depends on the person who was writing the AI algorithm, right? And, and so I always say for people, and AI is going to touch everything, whether we like it or not, for people to be able to build those solutions, they have to have an education in history and philosophy and ethics, so that they bring that holistic thinking to doing the things that, you know, that matter that need to be done. I personally also think that sustainability is a key aspect that we need to address. And if we really start to filter kids at an early age, we're going to lose that holistic view which will be to the detriment of technology as well as everything else that we need in the world to happen at the moment. So yes, music to my ears. Okay, thank you. Um, unless anyone else wants to come in, let's take uh, a quick question because we are running out of time. Um, this is to anybody who'd like to answer. Will moving the university admission system to being a post qualifications admission system help with removing the pressure on assessment stroke linear exam type timetables and enable more flexible admissions to be developed. Anyone like to take that? Sarah. Well, I think inevitably it'll take away all of the heat from GCSE style um, 16 plus assessment uh, because you won't you won't need that. Um, I think the danger of all of this, of course, is that we end up with multiple entry exams for different universities. So we do have to be careful what we wish for. But um, absolutely something which which moves it post 
um, your, your, your sort of terminal education exam, sort of which you take around 18, I think is going to make it a lot easier for universities and everyone to judge much more fairly um, people's uh, capability for university. And I think it will remove a lot of those inequalities in the application process, um, which we're talking about such a lot, uh, which stand in the way of social mobility too. Okay, Alice? Um, yes, and to, uh, to add to that, and also to a point um, that Kate raised around things like T-levels, I'm concerned that T-levels are being used as a way of shutting off other avenues for other qualifications. I'm particularly thinking about BTECs and yeah. uh, extended diplomas. Um, what we must make sure is that um, when we broaden out the curriculum, we do that uh, fairly and with, and with real equity, and that we don't uh, pick and choose some vanity project to... Uh, curtail qualifications which we know are recognised by employers, recognised by young people, recognised by HEIs um, as, as great stepping stones both into higher education, into apprenticeships and into the world of work um, and um, you know look at uh, qualifications that are at the moment unproven and I think again and I, I feel it's been my theme throughout this discussion this afternoon another false dichotomy it is you know heart um, or hand, it's uh, academic or technical. No, it isn't. You know, the brightest and most academic need to be able to study music and art and design and technology. Those who may not enjoy doing uh, the three sciences may flourish uh, doing drama. It, it's all about broad, uh, broad choices and the opportunity for young people to be able to flourish and not curtail them and throw them down an avenue and, and to use Sarah's um, expression earlier, down this cul-de-sac of narrowness, which encourages uh, young people to uh, be forced to study a very narrow number of subjects um, in a highly uh, unproductive environment, which then gives us these false results. And I want to pick up on one other thing that Mita said, and that was about personality. And if I put to one side the fact that Edge's speciality is around policy and research and think of myself as an employer. What do I look for in the people that I bring into my team? I look for dynamic, engaging, innovative, interesting people. And if they are highly qualified and have a double first from Oxford, that is fantastic, but that is not the first thing I look for. I look, about, I look to see if they'll integrate into the team, if they believe in the cause, if they're going to help further our objectives. Those are the things I'm looking for. The exams do not help me make that judgment. I make that judgment in the interview. I think about the sort of person that I want to work with. I think of the graduate that I want to have at my organization. And when I say graduate, I don't mean HE graduate. I mean graduate of the education system. And I think we need to put much more thought into that. And when you think about how employers, uh, as Mita said, uh, now look for candidates, you know, they're doing psychometric testing. They may have four or five rounds of interviews because they're trying to eke out those sorts of traits that we just are not getting from our exam system. Okay, thank you. Um, that's all we've got time for with the questions. Sorry if your question didn't get asked. Um, we just had so many lovely questions. Um, probably the, the two words that came up the most often in that discussion was false dichotomy. Um, everything seems to be a false dichotomy and people trying to make everything black and white and life just isn't like that is it so thank you to all of you for really really interesting uh, presentations and discussion and on behalf of the edge foundation i'd like to say thank you to the speakers and of course to the edge team who have been beavering away behind the scenes and to you, the audience, for, for listening. And if you want to find out more about the work of the EDGE Foundation and any future events like this, visit edge.co.uk. Thank you all and goodbye.